episode is brought by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to my review of National Geographic's 2007 documentary, Prehistoric Predators. In part one, we covered some of the Pleistocene's biggest names, such as Arctotus, the short faced bear, Smilodon, and the dire wolf, which we now know wasn't an actual wolf. If you missed it, there was great stuff all around. This is certainly a documentary that tries its best to get the facts straight, though the age does show from time to time. Now we move on to the latter four episodes, moving away from the Pleistocene Epoch to look at the famous Megalodon, Terror Birds, Hell Pigs, Hyenodons, and a guest appearance from the Bear Dogs. Man, the Cenozoic was crazy and definitely deserves more love, so let's give it more love. But before we get started, I am changing the formatting of this one. Rather than doing the general positives, outdated, and problems, I'll just take each episode individually, one at a time. This should be more organized than jumping back and forth between subjects in every section. Okay guys, let's dig this up. Episode 4 of this series is centered around one of the most popular extinct predators, the giant killer shark Megalodon. Extant sharks are already feared across the globe, yet dolphins get a pass somehow. But combine this irrational fear of sharks with giant sizes out of a 50s monster movie, then add a dash of conspiracy theorists, and you've got yourself a pop culture icon. Prehistoric predators unravel some of that mystery and hype to get to the truth of what this shark was truly like. The end result is... well, they did a pretty good job. Paleontologists come across a big problem in studying Megalodon, and that there just isn't much to study. There are teeth, and there are a few vertebrae. That's it. We see this well explained here that yeah, most of a shark's skeleton is made of cartilage, the flexible tissue that makes up your ears, nose, and joints. Unfortunately for us, cartilage starts breaking down shortly after death, so no meg skeletons for us to study. Where are they? Killing is making a choice. Where are they? Without much to go off of, We've had lots of confusion as to what exactly the Megalodon is. Even as far back as the 1840s, it's been viewed as a very close relative of the modern great white shark, Carcharodon carcarius, named by Louis Agassiz as Carcharodon megalodon, based on the similarly triangular serrated tooth. When we get to 2007, this classification is still being debated. On one hand, we get Dr. Chuck Champaglio from Wright State University, who researches extinct sharks or chondrichthians. Citing differences in tooth anatomy, he argues for a classification as Carcharocles megalodon, separate from the great white and other laminid sharks. This would put the meg in another family called Otodontidae. This goes against other experts who argued the traditional view that, yes, the two are closely related, citing similarities in the vertebrae. I always appreciate a lively debate in documentaries. There are always gaps in our understanding of the past, so not every answer is clear. Don't get me wrong, there are many things scientists definitely know, but sometimes there's room for debate. That's one advantage of this format with the talking heads guiding us through discoveries. There's room for questions, room for doubt, as opposed to the documentaries that take us back in time to watch our subjects. Since we're actually in the past, there's little room for questions. It is what it is. It is what it is. <laughs> Though those shows have their own pros as well. Anyways, I gotta give it to National Geographic for showing audiences this debate, questioning the norm, especially when many other programs at this time were just sizing up the Great White and then slapping on the name Megalodon. Programs like Jurassic Fight Club, Shark Week mockumentaries, and prehistoric predators. Yeah, despite pushing the envelope, it's mostly talk. The portrayal we're given is pretty much another giant white shark. Nowadays, Champaglio's point of view is more widely accepted. Not only is this beast classified as an otodontid, the scientific name has been switched to Atodus megalodon since it descended from the earlier species of Atodus. The modern great white we know and love is now believed to be closer to mako and salmon sharks, 
forming the family Lamnidae. Aside from its classification, a lack of a skeleton also means we don't know exactly how large the Meg was. Experts have taken what bits and pieces we have, the teeth, and extrapolated what size shark would have wielded such weaponry. Prehistoric Predators gives an estimated length from 15 to 17 meters and a mass of 45 metric tons, which is all very reasonable. This coincides nicely with a recent 2022 paper by Jack Cooper et al. that places a 16 meter individual at 48 tons. Of course, different lengths would correspond to different sizes, but this show had it nailed. There's also a pretty reasonable modern estimate given to their bite at 40,000 pounds of force. Megalodon may have had the strongest bite ever in the animal kingdom. To put this into perspective, that's nearly twice the force of Dinosuchus and five times that of Tyrannosaurus. And so this video doesn't get too bloated, I have to thank Creative Differences for not entertaining the myth though, well maybe Megalodon's alive today. Like every other predator shown, a clear explanation is given as to why they went extinct. There are no ifs, ands, or buts about it. This was a coastal, warm water shark that preyed upon the whales in its environment. As the oceans grew colder, whales grew in size and moved further north. Without access to their main food source, and without the same thermoregulating capabilities of white sharks, this creature died out about 3.6 million years ago. I'll go into detail with my next paleo myth, but prehistoric predators pretty much nailed this episode. Up next comes episode 5, Terror Birds, which changes up the usual formula by featuring two main subjects, Kalenkin and Titanus. This episode is split in half between these two. We begin with Kalenkin in Miocene Argentina 15 million years ago, then transition into Pliocene North America for Titanus. Right off the bat, I'm happy that we get two distinct birds here. Even though they're both in the terror bird family, Forest Rackaday, there are some key differences aside from their settings. Kalenkin is a very unusual species, well, compared to its relatives. A giant flightless bird of prey already sounds unusual. This species had a far more slender, elongated beak as opposed to its more robust relatives such as the featured Titanus and Dalgalornis and Forest Vacus itself. Its lower leg bone, the tarso metatarsus, is also longer than in other terror birds, suggesting higher speeds and maneuverability. Kalenkin in the show runs down its prey in a marathon, taking advantage of this fact. My biggest worry was that Titanus would just be an echo fighter of the former, or vice versa. That rather than being two distinct types of terror birds, they'd receive a slightly different coat of paint. Thankfully, this is 100% not the case. A pretty good job is also done showing how their environments were unique with the two living 10 million years apart on different continents. Kalenkin hunted the nodo ungulate Homaladotherium. Nodo ungulata was a diverse and now extinct order of South American ungulate mammals. You may also remember Toxodon from Prehistoric Park as an example. Meanwhile, the North American Titanus feasted on the horses that had yet to disappear from the New World as we discussed last time. But unfortunately for this bird, well, we saw some of the competition it had to endure. Bears, saber tooths, wolves. Despite the heavy competition, they were able to survive here for about 3 million years, kind of putting a dent in the usual black and white story of North versus South. During the Great American Interchange, North American animals outcompeted the South Americans. Northerners may win when the South are traitors trying to preserve slavery, but in paleontology, the narrative isn't that simple. Southern terror birds did thrive in the North. So did ground sloths and armadillos. Creative Differences has nice attention to detail here, as we are specifically given Smilodon gracilis, the smallest and earliest Smilodon species, rather than a repeat of the S. fatalis we saw before in episode 1. Then, instead of recycling the dire wolf, we're given the appropriate Edwards wolf, which may be an ancestor to today's coyote. My regret here is how no other South American predators are mentioned. Kalenkin is assumed to be the undisputed champion of the continent. 
Forget the giant land crocs of decades or those strange marsupial-like sporacidons with some members evolving giant sabers convergently apart from the cats up north. It would have been awesome to see such bizarre creatures on screen. One outdated bit I have with this episode is the implication, if not outright stated, that the Force Vacids first evolved in South America, which would make sense considering how abundant they were there for much of the Cenozoic era. However, this interpretation of events has been cast into doubt. A previous contender for the first Force Vacid, Paleo Psilopterus, <laughs> may be a basal cariamiform instead, still part of the same order. Instead, it's possible that these top South American predators really had their origins in the Old World, known from partial remains, only a femur, the Algerian Lavocatavis comes from as early as the Eocene, though its classification is still up for debate. Then there's the Middle Eocene El Eluthi Eleutherornis from Western Europe, with such early force vacuids already flightless and pretty tall at about one and a half meters, it's very possible that they started in the old world, probably Africa. There's just one problem. How in Shrek's green swamp did a flightless bird cross the Atlantic? Well, it could have been done by island hopping, made easier without the presence of kamikaze zeros, or by the birds floating on rafts, like we see in hat tag documentaries. Whichever way, they were lucky that the distance between Africa and South America was much less than it is today. So traversal from the Old World to the New World was possible. Again, Old World and New World from the European perspective, but not to Native Americans, yada yada, we've been through this one before. But I'm using these terms for the sake of convenience. There's still some debate here because, yeah, some of these species are fragmentary, and who knows what else experts will find. But as of 2023, this seems probable. Actually, a similar situation is correctly presented with Titanus, or the ancestor to Titanus, since its fossils found in Texas place its arrival in North America at at least 5 million years, 2.5 million years before the Isthmus of Panama connected the continents. This means Titanus had to either swim, or raft, or quantum leap its way across. Before I move on, it is worth mentioning how the Kalenkin is strangely undersized. In a show like this, you'd think the creators would want to wow audiences by showcasing their correct grand proportions, or by oversizing their subjects to seem more impressive. The species is placed at only 7 feet tall, which is more in line with Titanus, when it was really 10 feet tall at the head. The only weight estimate I could find put them at 220 pounds, or somewhat over, but the series places them at 400 pounds, so this may be an exaggeration. How do you undersize and oversize at the same time? If you have to be inaccurate, just pick one and roll with it. Okay. Okay, and lastly with these guys, is how very briefly they're compared to Sariemas as their closest living relative. It's cool how they're mentioned, but too bad this is more of a cameo. Spending a little more time with them would have been cool. These are still 3 foot avian predators, continuing the legacy of hunting small South American animals. Next time, can we throw a little more love their way? Our sixth episode covers the dreaded Entelodonts, also known as the Hell Pigs. Most of the focus goes to what I assume is Archaetheria mortini. Too bad their name is never explicitly stated in this episode. The subjects are always referred to as Entelodont. I'm not sure why this decision was made. Did the writers think Archaetherium was too difficult for audiences? If this is the case, then National Geographic, Creative Differences, whoever, needs to give viewers more credit. Sure, there are dumb people out there, very dumb people, but mainstream audiences, especially ones who choose to watch a paleo documentary, can be really smart. The other Entelodont featured is the massive, terrifying Dino Hyas. Accuracy-wise, this may be a weaker episode. Not only do they not even name their main attraction, but even the genus Dino Hyas is outdated. Severely outdated. 
Even as far back as 1998, before my lifetime, this genus was synonymized with Deodon shoshonensis. The Dinohyus hollandi type specimen found in Nebraska in 1905 was far more complete than the 1878 Deodon holotype, a lower jaw versus an entire skeleton, but the older name takes precedence. So in a series of unfortunate events, neither name given in episode 6 is correct. To make matters worse, there are moments when footage of one animal is used when the other is being discussed, only adding to the confusion. It happened several times but could have been easily avoided in the editing room. Another issue I have here is how Archaetherium is nicknamed Pig from Hell, while what I will be calling Deodon is branded as the Terminator Pig. Fun nicknames, they do superficially resemble modern pigs with their similar morphology or physical characteristics. Too bad at the time, the creators didn't know it was purely superficial. So anyone who walks away from the show without doing any further research won't realize that these aren't actual sewids. Both real pigs and intelodonts are even toed ungulates, audiodactyls as they're called, though that's about it. That's as close as they get. You mean nothing to me. No one does. Immediately after Prehistoric Predators aired, in 2008 and 2009 came studies which combined the morphological data with new molecular data. The end results place hell pigs as closer relatives of hippos and cetaceans. Now they're even more horrifying in my opinion. Hippos can kill 500 people each year. Now picture a predatory and more terrestrial version. Yeah, I would fetal position in a corner if I ever saw one. Archaetherium is portrayed as the ancestor of Deodon, directly evolving into the latter. The two were very closely related, but this may be an oversimplification. It is possible that Deodon descended from Asian intelodonts like para and Teledon. The jury may still be out on this one, since it shares features with both Asian and North American relatives. Prehistoric Predators does take the time to point out how Entelodons were not strictly carnivorous like we saw with, say, Smilodon. Instead, its dentition reveals a more varied, omnivorous diet. Sure, there were large canines that caused major damage to prey items, but also grinding molars. There is evidence in the fossil record of a predator-prey relationship between Archaetherium and the small camelid Pobotherium, as is shown here with an entire stash of chewed up victims, sporting bite marks in line with the Intelodonts. Killer Pig ends with the arrival of Amphicyon, aka the Bear Dog. Having these new, more derived carnivoran predators on the scene spells the death of Deodon here. Amphicyon is glorified as a smarter hunter that used its big brain to outcompete its larger rivals. So where these entelodonts had relatively archaic, simple, smooth brains, know your place, trash. The entelodons saw themselves outgunned, outmanned, outsmarted, outplanned. As mentioned by the narrator, it still lasted nearly 3 million years, even with the new competition. So, simply being outcompeted may be another oversimplification. We should look at Middle Miocene environmental changes as well. The Langean stage saw rising global temperatures, though followed by an extensive cooling period that the hell pigs didn't live to experience. These changes in the environment caused more grasslands, more plains that Deodon wasn't as well adapted to. As for the Amphicyon, this is probably the species A. Galushai, rather than the larger, more famous species A. Ingens it may be ancestral to. Despite the nickname Bear Dogs, these were neither bears nor dogs. Rather, they were older relatives, being basal caniforms, more related to dogs than cats, but still not the true babies we know and love. You can see where they got the name though. Amphicyon walked plantigrade on its heels and palms like a bear instead of on its digits. Yet they have these long dog-like tails and faces. Were they these super brilliant pack hunters? Probably not, but you know how these documentaries are. Higher intelligence can only be displayed via pack hunting. The bear dog likely found success in open plains by being a pursuit predator that chased down its prey over long distances. 
This adaptation to growing grasslands, plus needing less food than the massive Deodon, may have given it the edge. Hyenodon 2 features heavily in this episode, but gets the finale for itself. So on to the next one. Not gonna lie, this final episode comes across as an unnecessary retread since we just saw a lot of Hyenodon previously, and we just had an episode about how much awesomer our Ethereum was. So it's weird that now the creators turn around and be like, Oh yeah, Hyenodon was awesome too guys, we promise. Oh well, I'll give this one a fair shake. Now, there are many different types of Hyenodon, over 30 named species that ranged across North America, Europe, and Asia, during the Eocene and the Ligocene. Maybe some even survived into the Miocene. Also, they came in all sizes. One species, H. Microdon, only grew to 11 pounds. Then compare that house cat sized carnivore to one the size of a bear, the Eurasian H. Gigas, which grew to over 830 pounds. We're dealing with neither here. Instead, we're given the largest North American species, Hyenodon horridus, which is explicitly called by its name. This species was more wolf-sized at about 130 pounds. It is slightly oversized at 70 kilograms, but oh well. I gotta love that bulbous head. No, this isn't an animation error like JFC's American Lion. It was just odd. Unlike the Hell Pigs, Talking Heads do clarify that name Hyenodon, so no one goes away confused about their relation to modern hyenas, which is none. It's a misnomer as neither the teeth or overall morphology are similar to those African floofs. It's too cute! It's, it's disgusting! In its environment, we see the same faces as before. Ancient camelids, small three-toed horses called Myohippus, and rhino sub Hyvacodon are each featured primarily to get slaughtered, so we know how cool their attackers are. Not much attention is given to them apart from their sacrifices. In Razor Jaws, we're shown Mary Coidodon, or the Oreodon, as a prey item. This dude is nailed with that strangely long body, stout little legs, rat thin tail, and short face. North America was full of them for about 30 million years, so it makes sense that Hyenodon would have eaten them. The Nictus 2 gets a brief cameo where it has its head crushed and that's it. Man, it'd be great to learn more about the creatures Hyenodon interacted with, but all we get are clips of them getting brutally murdered. There are a few bits where each of these are discussed, but that really just boils down to can they outrun their hunter? Yeah, I get this is prehistoric predators, not prehistoric prey. The focus is on how these Cenozoic beasts hunted, thrived, and went extinct. Still, show the herbivores and smaller carnivores some more love instead of playing the same five hyenid on clips over and over and over. Oh, and with the Nictus, the narrator constantly refers to it as a saber-toothed cat while I slam my hat against the wall. The Nictus is a Nimravid, not a Felid. Nimravids were part of Feliforma, being related to true cats, though not cats themselves. Sure, they had saber teeth. Like I said in the first part, these weapons appear many times in the fossil record. So as opposed to Smilodon and other Machairodons, the Nictus was a false saber toothed cat. We do get some mixed messaging here. The previous episode claimed that this predator died out at the end of the Oligocene, yet here we see it competing directly with the Miocene Amphicyon. So which is it? And I should point out, speakers finally called the Entelodont Archaeotherium. It looks like either some backpedaling is going on here, or the writers were actually awake when writing this one. What a difference a cup of coffee can make. Finally watched and reviewed, that was National Geographic's Prehistoric Predators. For the most part, I had a good time revisiting this old friend from days long past. In many areas, I was pleasantly surprised. We didn't get anything too awesome bro, we usually explore enough aspects of each predator's lives, and there's an emphasis on the science. As expected for a documentary that's 16 years old, there's a lot that doesn't hold up to modern paleontology. Hey, it's been a very enlightening 16 years. There are new groundbreaking discoveries almost weekly, so I don't blame the creators too much. 
but that does mean large segments are now invalidated. Most episodes are great for their time, but it seems like they fumbled a bit for those last two. This is a tough one to grade with so much good, so much outdated, and some avoidable problems. My gut is telling me to give prehistoric predators a great position with a low B+. Gosh, this one took ages to watch, research, and write, but I hope you enjoyed this video. Certainly lots of love and passion went into making it. Well, what are your thoughts on Predators? Was I too nice? Too harsh? What would you have ranked it? Let me know in the comments below, and remember if you enjoyed this video to please leave a like, subscribe, and to check out my social media. See you next time.